Okay, so with your Travis CI pipeline, uh, working with GitHub, you'll have an indication of the builds that are going on, and it will indicate the latest build and the outcome of that build, passing or failed. If it failed, it may be an indication that it failed at, oh, oh no, oh man, okay, now I'm in trouble. Um, it, it, it may be an indication that it failed at the compilation stage, but it may also be an indication that it failed at the, um, at the stage, for example, of uh, checking the style or uh, testing. Now, generally speaking, um, tests are not going to be all the same at the same level of importance. There's going to be unit tests, there's going to be system tests, acceptance tests, and this key one called the smoke test. Now, a smoke test is automated. There are some tests you will do manually that are not automated. There should be. Why would you do a manual test of a system? Because if you test the system manually, you might find things related to how the user would use it that um, Good. bugs or issues. So I like that. But let me unpack that some more. One of the reasons you may find some things that would affect the user is because you can sense things when you actually look at it and you're testing it manually that automated testing is not going to pick up. Automated testing basically is can confirm the answer is correct or that it went to the right page or the results were shown correctly or something. What is it not going to pick up? What, what things do we call non-functional things would it not pick the up? The feel of the app, the flow of the app. Okay. Visuals. Yeah, okay. So like how quickly it refreshes, whether it looks looks weird. <laughs> like, okay, there's, uh, there's a strange color combination. I can't read the, with this setting, I can't even read the text because it's orange on a red background. You know, it, um, it, it shows something that's confusing. Um, whether or not it should go where we assume it should go, where the user would assume it would go. So like if you click on a button, yeah. and you expect it to go somewhere in a completely different place. Oh, okay, but, uh, so I like that, but generally that can be tested by an automated test. It could say, did it go to the right place? And you say, the right place is X. And did it, it went to Y? No, it's not at X. But, but often there's things that like by our judgment look weird. I'll tell you another thing. I mean, um, sometimes you get a sense of flakiness with an application. It's just slow to refresh. It's, um, you, you occasionally get a weird message and I'll probably uh, be, be um, diagnosed with an automated test, but um, uh, you know, maybe it, um, it doesn't always appear immediately or what have you. And, and so there you might pick up something. So I like the idea you pick up things you don't through automated testing, but what, I, what other reason do we test manually? Um, outside the board testing, what's it called? Uh, oh, black box? Black box testing. Yeah, yeah, so uh, black box testing is often done manually, that's right. It's not so often that, well, we can do white box testing. We can run through with the debugger and call, you know, do this and test this little bit of code or whatever. You can do that actually, knowing the structure of the code. We could, we could do that manually. We could call things from GDB manually and see if they work. But generally, we do black box testing with with manual testing. But what manual testing allows you to do is to be flexible. It allows you to alter what your testing plan is and say, oh, that looks weird. Why did it do that? Let me try that again. Do I see it again? I thought I saw something strange there. It like flashed a window that disappeared. I saw this the other day. You know, boom, flashed a window. Like, what the heck is that? Came up and, and disappeared. Let me see if I do it again. Boom, did it again. Okay, so that's a system trouble incident. That's, that's, it, it, it was something that could throw off a user. So manual testing is good. Now a smoke test though is always automated. The job of a smoke test is not to discover per se new bugs, new types of bugs, or to verify particular specific type of functionality alone. 
It's to basically test, is the system in a sane state? Or, put it another way, is the system worth other people getting? Give me a situation where you may get a compilation that works, but the system is not worth getting. So in other words, someone checks in, it compiles, but, but it's not worth other developers getting. If you scan a QR code and it takes like 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, so it's just incredibly painful to, to, slow. to use, good. Give another thing that could be so bad you don't want other people to get it. Everything's so, the same color? Yeah, yeah, good, good, yeah, so you can't see, like, you can't read anything, good, good, yeah. Um, you can't even log in. It's like it hoses the first page of the app or something, or, you know, the first screen. Um, or this is a security issue, right? Now, some of these things can be tested automatically through something called the smoke test. And the job of the smoke test is basically to put the system through its paces with a couple simple tasks. It's not perfect, but it will, the idea is to spot if there's anything so broken about it, it's not worth getting. So, What's often done in 371 for this, and I don't think it's a terribly bad thing, is you string together a bunch of smaller tests that will each test different parts of the functionality. Alternatively, you can write a smoke test that will you know, invoke this function, then this one, then this one. It's like going through a set of user steps. So it logs in, it performs this function, it requests this, it submits this, verifies the result, if those basic functions aren't working, it's not worth getting. It, it, it's so broken, you've broken something core on it. So let me ask this. Can you build the smoke test, the full smoke test for the full application immediately? No. No. It evolves. And ladies and gentlemen, testing in general evolves. Why does testing evolve as you write an app? Why does it evolve? Because when you write something simply, yeah. you might think of a certain number of cases, and then something new comes up, either new functionality or something like you didn't think so, yeah. or something you didn't think of, yeah. will come up, and then you have to test for that too. And then those cases Good. will lead to other thoughts Good. and ideas. And this is one of the, Jesse put his finger on one of the key <laughs> lessons of this class. Key lesson. When there's a problem with your system, don't just fix it, try to learn from it. So when you find a bug, you can learn from it in what ways? How could you learn? Okay, so you find a bug in your system. Yeah, you wanna fix it, generally. We'll come back to that. Sometimes you don't wanna fix it immediately. But suppose you wanna fix it, how could you learn from it? How could you benefit from learning from it? Generally, I'd say you benefit more by, by learning from it and taking actions later than you will by actually fixing it immediately. Why is that? Well, how could you learn from it? Well, if you figure out where it comes from, then you can figure out what causes it and what the Good. issue is. And then you can also figure out where issues may resolve from that piece of the code that you found where the bug results results good out. okay so i heard a couple things there <clears throat> one thing is where did it come from mm -hmm. what caused it you could you could try to figure out what allowed this to get in there let, let me let me sharpen that though okay. it's not just what mechanically caused it it's you know did we have incomplete documentation on the, how this part of the system works? Was there a misunderstanding between develop developers? Was it, was it in, you know, outdated documentation, for example? It said you could pass a null in the latest version you can. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what was it that allowed that bug to come about is an important question. Um, you know, was it incomplete knowledge about how React J works? Maybe we need a tutorial, for example, to spread knowledge around about React J, right? Um, okay, so that's one thing. Another thing is you could learn how to test for it more effectively. 
to find it sooner? Like, why did it take as long as it did to get to fix this, to identify this? How could I find it even sooner next time? You know, this, this bug's been around since two weeks ago. Why didn't we stumble on this? Like, why didn't our smoke test catch it, maybe? Why, did, why didn't the unit tests associate with this catch it? Why didn't the system tests? Why didn't our, why didn't our peer reviews catch it, right? But, but don't, don't do that in a, I mean, you gotta, you gotta approach it in a positive way. How could we test better learning from this? How could we do peer reviews better learning from this? It's not, you know, why were we so stupid? It's, it's how can we do better next time? What can we learn to fix, to prevent these sort of things in the future, to learn, to learn from it, to, to, uh, to avoid them from happening or find them sooner? Another thing, Jesse, I heard is, okay, now that we fix this, maybe that bug hid other bugs, for example. How could a bug hide other bugs? Give me an example. Um, well, if that bug is indirectly causing another bug that okay. you don't know, of, like you don't know the cause of that bug, but it's related to this bug. Okay. And that the the bug you're like, let's say you have bug A and bug B. Mm -hmm. Bug A, mm -hmm. you know about, yep. but you don't know what's causing it, and you look through the code yep. and you don't see anything wrong. And then you see bug B, and bug B might be causing bug bug A such that bug A isn't a problem anymore because you fix bug B. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, could, could be. Sometimes you get bugs that depend on each other. So, so like, like as soon as you fix A, B is counting on A being broken. It's like, it's, it's counting on A doing the wrong thing. And so B is not going to work. Um, you may have done this in coding here, in this very room over here, right? You, you th something's not working and well it works if you have two bugs <laughs> it works even though when you, you'd like to have none that sometimes happens there's another thing too which is when you get something so broken you can't even test beyond that area of the code because like the functionality is so broken you can't even test it it just dies immediately whereas if it continued you'd see other bugs you'd see more subtle bugs do you see what I mean yeah, okay, so a smoke test, its job is not to discover new bugs, but to discover stability problems. Make sure that things aren't so wedged in terms of the, the, the um, function of the application that it's not worth getting. And we talked about that earlier. You can't log in, everything is red. <laughs> everything, you, know, you can't read anything. Um, uh, it's super slow. It, it's, it's incredibly slow, so much so it's debilitating. Like, if you get it, you can't get anything done. Yeah, that would be a real problem. Then you roll back, okay? So a smoke test is designed to sort of allow you to spot those things in an automated way, in an automated way, to avoid people getting that. In other words, say the build's broken, by implication, don't get the latest code until it's rolled back. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so communicating bug status is pretty important. Uh, Travis CI, I believe, will send messages when the build breaks. And you should view these messages as important. There was a team several years ago that got in trouble. They didn't get in trouble with me. me. They got in trouble with themselves. Because their, their build was so broken on such a regular basis, they started to ignore it. It was just like, okay, what's well, new? No. You know, it's broken, it's broken. So they didn't actually know when there was a bad thing. It's like crying wolf, right? They didn't know when there was a bad situation because it was just, they just thought it was another broken build. Um, it's like your fire alarm goes off every hour and then your house actually burns down and you don't know, right? <laughs> okay, um, so generally with, uh, with builds, traditionally there's been a way of trying to communicate them with the group, and the group kind of works around the builds. So people want to know if a build fails, then they might want to know so they can go help straighten it out. 
roll back the changes, figure out how to fix them. And so often it's associated with alerting or very visual indications. I want you to look through these. I don't have time to cover them. But you should look through some of these principles because they apply to this class. Commit code on a frequent basis. Refresh your code in case someone else is modifying it on a frequent basis. You should be encouraged to fix code long before it's committed and ideally to have it inspected to run tests on it before it's committed. Right? If builds break, fix them immediately. Um, and you should have automated, automated tests. Okay? Um, some automated tests. Um, and before you check in, you should have a private build. Why have a private build before you check in? Why not just say, what the heck, I'll commit it to, to the repo and run the build there. Why have a private build? So you don't check in a broken build? Yeah, so you don't check in a broken build. Before you check in, you know it's broken. And so you fix it. And you should always be running the build, making sure it's fine, and then check in. Let me ask this, though. OK, so I go, I'm writing my code, I've finished my code, I run a build, it's fine. Is it ready? Should I really check in yet? What am I forgetting? I'm writing my code, I'm finishing it, I'm building it, it's OK. Should I go check in? Test it. OK, test, good. I like that. Very good. So I test it, good. What else am I missing? Refresh my code against anyone else who's changed it. If someone else has changed the code in the meantime, how could that occur? How could I be working my code and I get a refresh from someone else, I do a, an update and, and I get code from others? Um, how could that have happened? Well, they could have been writing code while I was writing my code. They checked it in before I did, right? Could my code not work against theirs? It's possible. Yeah, if they changed a method that I call to take an extra parameter. Now my code can't call it because it doesn't provide that extra parameter. It sure could happen. So do an update, build, run unit tests, maybe get it inspected. Now I check in. OK, check in. It ran on my private machine. Does that guarantee that it runs on the build server? No. Why not? Dependencies. Yeah, it could have. It could have dependencies, which are not on the build server. Uh, it could have environment variables, for example, which you've set locally, which aren't properly set on the build server. Someone could also have checked things in on the build server. After you did an update, while you're running your tests or while you're getting inspected or what have you, um, you know you thought you were just going out for a quick bite and then you check it in and someone could have updated. So it is possible through no fault of your own that there's what's called a race condition. You check yours in just after someone checked theirs in and boom, it, it doesn't work together. It's not necessarily you're, you've done something terribly bad, it's just that um, you, you gotta maturely handle it because the build's broken and you don't want other people to get it. Okay, I have some recommendations for testing here, um, which uh, you know you should look at as well. Please go over these. And for database, use a local database sandbox. Rebuild the database and insert data in it automatically, automatically. So it's part of your automated build. Why would you rebuild the database, like a test database, as part of an automatic build? What gain would, might you have from that? Because if you're pulling something from the database and there's no database, it will automatically break. Like, if you have uh, dependencies being pulled from a database. OK. So, so that's good. But why don't we just leave the database in place? So. Maybe we filled it before by hand, and we'll just leave it. We don't need to touch it in the build. Well, one thing, if it's a test database, you need it to be 
in a reproducible state. Like it needs to be a, a reference state. If it's who knows what it is, well maybe sometimes the test will pass, sometimes they'll fail just because of what's in the database. You, if a test fails, you want it to be reproducible to fail. Like someone else tries it, it'll fail as well. So you want the database to be in a known state. But let me ask this, database schema. Have, you, have any of you take people taken 355? Okay. Do you know, have you encountered SQL? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you know about this thing called a database schema? Yeah. Yes. Okay, it describes the structure of the database, the types, the names of the columns, that sort of thing. Their size, sort of R chart, 255 or whatever, right? If you have a database schema for a, an app or a web app, a phone mobile app or a web app, do you think that remains the same through all versions of the app? No. Let's suppose I want to go back to an earlier version of the app. I want to go back to see if a bug existed as the app was two weeks ago. So I'm trying to track down where this bug is. I want to say, hey, that build we showed the stakeholder two weeks ago. Did that have the same bug in it? How would I, how would I get the code to do that? To go back and produce that earlier build? To build as it was two weeks ago. Where would I go? Yeah, it's in the repo. But how does the database schema has changed since then? Like, in other words, Today's database schema is not the same as it then. Is it possible that that code won't properly work because the database has changed? Yeah. So in other words, I want to be able to go back not only in terms of the code, but in terms of the what? The, the schema. So the database schema needs to be in the what? The repo. In the repo. Yeah. That's right. Darn right. So. The database schema needs to be in the repo. The database schema can evolve. And hence, if the database schema evolves, generally you rebuild the database to reflect the new database schema. Because it might change. And you want to be able to then insert code into it, et cetera. Okay. Um, you folks are going to become repo men in repo one. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, um, who's going to be the build master? Jay, he's not here. Okay, okay, you're not saying that just because he's not here. No, no, you are the build master. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, okay, there should be a one-step build. This should not be a thing that requires someone to poke certain several buttons. It should be like, code is checked in, it builds. That's it. You'll like that. You'll like that the night before you hand in the deliverables because you don't have to every time go through a certain dumb little ritual. You just check it in, boom, built. Does it work, does it not? And you don't have, not everyone has to know all the details of it, okay? Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, terms of other things. Um, Many milestones. Ladies and gentlemen, um, you're going to have a process for assigning tasks. Ikram? Yeah. So Ikram is going to be working to make sure that people are assigned tasks. And when you take on the task, it's important that she know and yourselves know what it means to be done. And I've mentioned this before, but I just want to reiterate. It's pretty ambiguous in traditional s verbal software engineering. Say, hey, you done with implementing that? Yeah, I'm done. Does that mean I've coded it? Does that mean I've coded it and compiled it? Does it mean I've coded it, compiled it, tested it? Does it mean I've coded, co compiled, tested, and had it inspected? These are different things. If you haven't compiled it, it's kind of not really significant and you say it's done. Okay, maybe it means you've done a lot of the heavy lifting on it, but it ain't, it's, it's not anywhere near close to done. Uh, because after all, 
there's a lot of work even maybe in getting it to a compiling state. Similarly, if it's not tested, maybe you have to go back and redo it. So, so you want clarity on whether things are, are done. And you're gonna want to, to monitor like what's going on. One of the key things is how much time you are spending on tasks, okay? How much time you actually spend on tests? And I'd like you to record as well, this is important, how much you estimate. I estimate it's gonna take this, how long does it actually take? And you wanna have a clear understanding of binary completion. By binary completion, is it done or not? You know, is it implemented, unit smoke test, release notes, and this is any documentation, checked in, ready for quality assurance, right? Um, maybe it's also gotta go through desk check or some sort of check. You should think about um, you should think about some of these systems for code review that can be done at a distance um, so they don't require you to be co-located. So for example, uh, you could get code um, reviewed by one person when they're at home from another person's home and you don't have to come together for that, which is good. Um, okay. Um, don't worry about the metrics as much this year, but the uh, binary milestones, certainly. Okay, testing. Testing, ladies and gentlemen. This is often the biggest difference from earlier, from most classes you take. What I expect, I'm expecting here is pretty significant, okay? It includes unit tests, typically by the developer. System tests, typically by the test team. Who's the test team here? Um, Very good. Thank you, Jesse. Now, the developer here, Moam? needs to provide code to the testers as early as possible, early and on an ongoing basis. So try not to do it like three hours before the deliverable is due or else testing is not gonna be that helpful. In which case, when we test it, myself and the TAs, and we find issues, it will not be viewed well. So it's in your interest to make sure that Jesse has that in place, okay? Um, has, has code in place. Now, one of the things we're gonna be talking about is this notion of testability. How do you make your code testable? That may sound weird, but a given Code to implement a given set of functionality within a program can either be more testable or less testable. Well, give me some characteristic that would make code difficult to test. No comments. Okay, good. No comments. I like it. How about another thing? Unclear variable names. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> Supposedly there are videos of me critiquing variable names online. Um, how about other things? What else could make code difficult to test? Depends on the language as well. Okay. Yeah. So certain languages may force you to provide certain types of information. That is actually true historically. Um, certain may, oh, like horrible, like, like, Perl, for example, writing it without function, without indicating in its header what the what the parameters are, you pass it, and you have to pull them out of the sort of the stack. It's it's horrible. It's horrible. Don't use Perl. Okay, don't use Perl. Um, actually, you can do Perl better than that, but you can write it in ways. It allows you to write it in ways that will cut off your arms, so to speak. It's horrible. Fourth, I also don't like, to, well, I won't go into it. Okay, um, okay, what other things can make code difficult to test? Um, 
So I like these things you said, but there's actually a lot more. Go-to statements. Okay, yeah, go-tos can be hazardous, so there's a paper on that, yeah, so that's true. Go-to considered hazardous, um, uh, what was it, considered dangerous, um, so that's true. How about other things, though? Think, think more, think back to 270 as well. Okay, let me ask this. Okay, so suppose I have, I have a core part of the system and it's 500 lines of code. And I give you two choices. Which is easier to test? It's all in one method, one function, or it's, in, it's divided up into 20 different functions. Some function. Yeah, some functions. Why is it easier to test? <laughs> For some functions. Uh, because you can test each function individually. That's right. And it's smaller. That's right. And it's clear what each function needs to do its job. What fun like what what it depends on. And you can test if that part of the code is working or this other part of the code is working. So that's good. Also, if you have the main code just calling off to these functions, you don't have to look at all the details of what those functions do if you don't want to. You could just see, oh, it's a call to this nicely named function. Better not be named like A, B, C, or foo, bar, baz, zap. Okay, don't, don't name your functions that, even though you may see me using them in lecture. Um, so, so if it's broken up into a lot of small functions, it's vastly easier to test. Why, give me another reason. Okay, so this big, honking, crufty, 500 line thing of code. Why is that hard to test well, if it's one function? Because it's harder to read, it's very, it's more than likely messier code. Hard to functions. read, good. It's harder to test things in the middle of it, like make it go this way versus that way. We'll be seeing with path-based testing, you often want to say, okay, I want to test this path through the code and that path, path through the code. I want to test it under this condition. And it's hard to do that in the middle because it's in the middle. You can't reach in and get it to go that way. And there could be side effects that happen due yeah. to earlier pieces of code. Yes, that that's right. may interfere with the middle. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So it's hard to kind of look inside of it and see if it's working properly or get it to go certain ways to make sure those when it goes that way, it's, it's, it's fine. So that's, that's, that's one way. Okay, let me, let me ask about this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you with the devil's advocate argument. Um, okay, so big single line function. Everything it needs to do its job is in there. I can test it. If I have a function A and it calls off to function B and C, how do I test A without testing B and C too? I mean, after all, I mean, normally when you have classes in Java or, or when you have JavaScript objects, do they do, are they solitudes? They only do things internally? No, they generally call off to other things, right? So how do you test that without testing all those other things? Uh, okay. Function, if you're calling function B to get an integer, yeah, you can just manually put like five. Okay. Okay. But suppose the code that you're testing has a call to B in it. So I like your idea. And actually, what are you talking about? It's the basis of something called dependency injection, and and actually, it's a key. It's a key technology of relevance and and inversion of control, which we may get to at some point. But. The fundamental technology that I'm talking about here is actually something called mocking. Okay? So if I have A and it depends on B, C, and D, the way in which I might test A together with B, C, and D sometimes, that's called an integration test. It's a bigger unit of testing. But if I want to test A without testing B and C and D, how do I do it? I engage in mocking. I mock out BCD. What does that mean, to mock them out? 
Well, basically, it means having a stub in where they are. It's a little bit like mom's idea here. So instead of actually calling B and getting back and having it do some big con calculation, maybe looking up in a database, maybe getting it from a website or whatever and giving me back a value, it just returns a value, a fixed value. And other times with mocking, I get it to return a random value. Other times I get it to return you know, ascending values. And mocking can allow me to test A without testing B and C because I can just say, hey, mock out B, C, D. Don't actually call them, just return fixed numbers or just, you know, if it doesn't return a value, just return or whatever. And that allows me to test A. But mo mocking frameworks like JMock or JSMock for JavaScript, Mockito, is there Mockito JS or something? The, these frameworks allow you to basically mock out these things. And for many of them, you can say, for some of them, you can say, hey, not only return a value, make sure you're not called more than once. Or make sure the arguments pass to you. You know, argument A and B, B is always greater than A. Or they're both greater than zero or both greater than or equal to zero, or always not null. So you can actually tell the mock, check these things when you're being called, and then return a, you know, a random value or what have you. So you should use mocking, okay? Test-driven development is required. What do I mean by test-driven development? Give me, an L, give me a key feature of test-driven development. Write a test to pass, or write a test to make, the, or to make it so it passes the code, then write the code that passes the test. Okay, so you write a test. Initially, that test should do what? It's a unit test, usually. Yeah, okay, that's true. So it should fail. It should fail initially yeah. because the code, the code isn't doing it. The code is like essentially non existent. Then you write the test, then you write the code to do what? To pass it. To pass the test, right? And so make it fail, make it run, and then make it right. Not with the W, but R. Make it right, right? You make it, then you might refactor that code, improve it some. You might also add in tests later, and that's a good thing. You might realize, oh yeah, man, we forgot about testing these certain types of things. Let's add a bunch of tests in there. Osgood called us on that. We gotta go, you know, gotta go add some tests. That's fine, but get that test in there from the start. Why do you do that? Other than Osgood told you to do that. Bulletproof your code. Okay, why does it help bulletproof your code? Because if you don't make sure that it works later on when you call it, it could just Good. explode. So we have we have a tendency as developers to think the development is where it's at <laughs> and to not write the tests. You're under pressure, you ignore the tests, you just develop code. You think that's where the real work is. Well, the real work, it can be worthless unless the tests are there to test it, but we, we still think that. Okay, what's, what's another, another reason that we do it? Well, writing the test first forces us to do what? It forces us to write them, yeah, but it forces, and, and to get them done, it that's good. It forces us to write the code at least kind of confidently. Yeah, because we actually, yeah, we have a goal. We think through, like, what does this need to pass, right? We think it through more seriously. And because of this, ladies and gentlemen, you should think about a, th a system called buddy testing, whereby one person writes the tests and the other writes the code. And unfortunately, if this were a normal 371 and there were hundreds of students out there, you know, just out there, all listening to this lecture, you don't think they're listening now? Um, so, uh, then they could um, exchange, like Moam, as, as a developer, you could exchange with someone else. The two developers write each other's tests and keep each other honest. But often it helps you write your own tests for test-driven development because it forces you to think through, what do I need to pass, right? But it can help to have others supplement them who might be thinking differently. And they could test your code, you could test their code. Okay, um, 
We do want manual and automated testing here. And we want test matrices that basically, remember I showed it last time? Tests on one axis and features or requirements or functionality on the other axis. Why do we do that? Make sure every bit of functionality feature is tested. Make sure every test tests something. After all, if, if it's not testing any feature, functionality, requirement, what good is it? How can a test become like that? How can a test become like that? If it was something that used to exist in the program? Yeah. And then you took it out. Darn right. Darn right. Sometimes tests serve to function once, and then they no longer serve a function. Right? Because the program evolves. The test was once need, needed to deal with the fact that there was this awkward workaround for something because we didn't have network connectivity. Now we have network connectivity, we don't need that anymore. We take it out and out needs to come the test. And if you have this traceability, if this documentation, what the test is for, it can help. So document test too, like what is this test for? What is it testing? Where does it go in the test matrix? Man, I need to bring my throat lozenges. Shout. Well, at least they learn about it too. Do you want a throat lozenge? I have some. Oh, that, that's really kind. I got a whole bunch in my office. That, that's really <laughs> kind of you. Um, might take you up a bit. Um, okay, so debug not just defects here, but process. Figure out how it is that this crept through. How it is there's a misunderstanding that's got into the code base. How do we miss it for so long? How can we catch it faster next time? Use a bug tracking system. Ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna use GitHub's issue tracking system. It's a good system. It can be used to track new features to be implemented, new bug, bugs that have to be fixed. You track, okay, now I'm saying bugs. I'm talking about defects, but the truth is I'm oversimplifying. Not everything that's in there for fixing is a defect. It could be based on a misunderstanding could be based on an inconsistency between the documentation that's available and, and the app. It could be based on a, uh, a misperception of what the system is supposed to do. It might be called the, the system trouble incident, but it's, a, it's, it's not necessarily a bug. Okay, you're gonna wanna build testability. So remember I said earlier, how do we make a system more testable? We had some good ideas, but there's some others. Assertions, we talked about them earlier. The code should assert. Assert helps a lot, testability. It helps catch the error sooner to its source, which helps debugging. And if you're testing where it's going wrong, often it will be the, the assertion that's catching the things, okay? There can also be sometimes, I ask you to put in place specifications. What's the purpose of this code? What are the preconditions and post conditions for the code? Do they do that in 270 still? Yeah. Preconditions, post conditions? Yeah. Do you talk about invariance or history properties? No. Okay, well, guess what? Preconditions and post conditions are coming back. Okay, okay. Don't drop yet. Okay. Um, uh, and you should be thinking about documenting that so someone could program against the specifications. The specifications describe what something does, not how it does it. Describes what's, what's its job, what is it required to do its job, what is it guaranteed, right? Um, that's another way of guaranteeing testability, of helping ensure testability. But I like the others, good variable names, for example. Um, good you know, use of commenting good function names that you're calling, et cetera. Okay, um, automate most tests. Sometimes we test things manually, and I would argue if a manual test fails, you should think about automating it. Why? It might become a issue that recurs. Yeah, why might it recur? Why might a test come back like a zombie from the dead? Or sorry, a test. A, a, Sorry, why might a defect come back? Okay, so, so in the immediate term, suppose we put in place 
uh, a, an automated test. We, we, we run a manual test, it fails. We put in place an uh, automated test. Could that be required again? In other words, could it be used very soon? Yes. Why? It could be used to test that we fixed the bug. We fixed the bug, right? Does it still exist? It could help someone reproduce the bug, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now suppose the bug's fixed. Oh man, if you go back and listen, this is just like, I'm, I'm like providing you all these answers for the final exam. If you listen to this and, and don't sleep, you'll, 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 you'll have all these answers for the final exam. This is just like, just setting it up for, for, for answering questions in the final exam. Okay, suppose that bug is fixed. Why might that bug come back? Why might it come back? Someone changes something that causes it to be how it was yeah. started before? Yeah, yeah, so they changed it back. There was a logical mistake that was made, and it gets fixed, and then it's causing problems somewhere else, and they change it back. Has that ever happened to you? Like you. Like, like, like you, you flail at it. Like you fix a bug, and yeah. then the you fix the bug earlier by creating another bug. Yeah, and that's the bug you created earlier exactly. creates the same bug. Yeah, precisely, that that happens. You get in these loops, right? Fix A breaks B. Fix B breaks A. Have you ever had that? Oh man, I think we all have, right? In fact, they may have it out there. If you have binoculars, maybe right down at the other side of the lab there. Um, okay. Uh, okay, how about another, another thing? Um, another reason might come back. Have you ever heard of a merge conflict? Yes. What's a merge conflict? You take two pieces of code and put them together okay. and they have parts that contradict each other. Good, good. And what, ha what happens typically with a merge conflict? What needs to happen? Well, someone needs to take ownership and, and merge yeah, them sensibly, right? Could you imagine a situation where a bug would come back in at that point? A rollback? Yeah, essentially a line that was taken out, actually in resolving the merge conflict, they put it back in. Because they think, oh, well, it's needed. Well, they didn't know, they weren't there when it got fixed, so they don't know that it needs to be fixed. So they put it back to the original one, and now the bug's in there again, right? So bugs come back. They come back a lot. And if you automate a test after creating it manually, after it fails manually, you can catch them much sooner. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you write a test, an automated test, check that it passed. That may sound weird, but the last time the class was this size, which is 2008, so it was bigger. It was eight people. Um, uh, we um, we had a team. It gave me their glowing. They were very proud. They handed me their glowing testing report. They had something like twenty different tests automated ran through the UI. These ones ran through the UI, and it said passed, passed, passed. Each one, it said three thumbs up, passed, passed. I don't know how there are three thumbs up. I guess one's a big toe or something. But it was it was three thumbs up every time. And then I looked at what these tests. I looked at the log for these tests. Like what did it say? And each of them passed because they didn't find an error. Guess why they didn't find an error? Because they couldn't even log into the system. It was like no. It was a web app. It was a web app to maintain the lockers for the C triple S and to borrow books from the library. Um, and and it didn't even it didn't even log into the system to test it, so they said, "Oh, it passed," <laughs> because it never got to the place to like test test where it was supposed to test, and so they said it passed. They didn't even look at the error messages, look at the error, look at the mess the log message, check to see if the error act the test actually passed. It's not enough to say it ran; it's it did it run and pass. Maybe it sounds obvious, but it wasn't obvious to them. And it hasn't been obvious to some other people as well in the industry. So run it. Run and check it. Okay. Um, you may 
We may this semester use containerization. We'll come back to that. Containerization is a key technology for tests. It is incredibly valuable to have a reproducible test environment that is completely restored to its original state when you're done and that doesn't depend on the vagaries of things like environment variables, how they differ on Linux or Windows or, or Mac. It has the same experience on each platform, exactly the same configuration from the ground up. So um, we'll talk about maybe containerization working for your system. Um, I'd said consider pair testing. Sadly, there's only one tester right now, but maybe someone else can help them out sometime with a bit of pair testing. Do testing side by side. Um, okay. Um, I think that's all. Okay. So you're going to plan a test environment. What is the test? Like, what's the environment in which you will test this app? Maybe it'll be different for iPhone and Android. But you want to have a clear platform under which you test it. It's not to say you want one to test it on several platforms, but at any given time, you want to have a clear platform um, on which to test it. If you're using an Android emulator or an iOS emulator, as is built into Xcode or built into Android Studio back in the day, uh, then, then you want to have a clear emulator configuration that other people know so that when they test it it's used they're testing it with the same same parameters okay um you want to reset the state every time you don't want it to test work sometimes and not others just because it's evolving and this is where containerization helps it also helps with the test environment um release criteria at what point is it releasable? You'll be classifying defects as to their priority and their severity. A priority one one is something that really must be fixed. Priority two, lower. Priority three, nice to fix, for example, going down. And you're going to want to have criteria. Maybe it's worth declaring it done if there's no more than two priority three bugs and one priority two bug. Um, no priority one bugs. Um, and you should be thinking with the requirements, can we derive tests from them? Traditionally, particularly in some industries, a lot of tests have been derived directly from requirements. Okay? Um, right. Um, okay. Uh, one final thing I'll say. Testing is a staged process. Staged not in the sense that it's fake, but in the sense it goes through phases. There's a set of bugs that we don't know about. I'm going to teach you techniques to estimate the size of this. How many bugs are there we don't know about right now? Then there are some bug reports. Some of these bug reports undergo a process called sanitization. Mark my words. Man, this is just like dripping with, with good stuff for the final exam. Chocolatey goodness. Okay, there's a process called sanitization. Sanitization basically is figuring out is a bug report meaningful? Give me an example of a bug report that's not, when I say meaningful, I mean meaningful or significant, like we care about it. Give me a bug report that we don't care about, particularly. This particular bug report, we really don't care about it. Uh, the misspelling of a word, maybe? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, uh, so, so there may be some that are really low priority. Like, like if it says Mercosoft instead of Microsoft, that's pretty high priority. You know, like when you on the flash screen, right? Microsoft Office. Um, okay, but give me another one. Okay, I'll tell you a few since time is short. Duplicates of old bugs. It's the same thing as reported last time. Particularly if it's already been fixed. It's outdated. It's based on a misunderstanding. These are 
these are things which might allow us to say, look, this is not that significant anymore. Um, so we go through a process called sanitization to figure out, is this a real, is it a significant bug report? If so, it becomes what's called an active bug. Then there's a process called triage by which we decide whether or not to fix. Why wouldn't you fix a bug? Anyone? Why not fix a bug? Because there's another more important bug. Good. Because if you fix it, it'll make very severe bugs. Okay. So this is, mom's point is, is an excellent one, particularly late in the game. So if it's just before the last deliverable, you don't have time for another round of testing. Would that make you more inclined to fix a bug or less? Less. 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 Because if you fix it, you might have caused worse bugs and you don't even have time to find them, to document them, to fix them. <laughs> so typically, it's a thing where you say the devil we know. This is like the devil we know. We, we, at least we could document it. We can give a workaround. We can tell Osgood, you know, don't click on that button. Use the menu item instead, right? And, and you can manage it. Whereas if you fix it, you fix this thing, Chances are the statistics are not promising. A lot of the time, fixing one bug causes others. And it varies based on the, the complexity of the fix, but it can be as much as 50% of the time. It causes errors. And if you don't have time to diagnose, to assess, to fix those errors, you're probably better off just dealing with this one, particularly if it's a lower priority bug. Okay, so you decide basically important bugs here. Is this worth fixing? Another thing is, yeah, we, we don't have time. This is a lower priority. It's level three. We're only going to fix more serious ones. Okay, here are important bugs. Now, these important bugs would typically be assigned to different developers. Developer A, Moam. Developer B, Moam. Developer C, Moam. Poor Moam. Okay. Um, now, he's going to claim at some point hopefully with you know, very good faith, on, on, on very good faith, that it's, it's fixed. He thinks it's fixed. He believes it's fixed. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that it's not closed until either the reporter or a tester verifies that it's fixed. Why not allow Mom to fix it? This is through no aspersions of Mom. Mom may be startlingly honest. Why not allow the developer who, who fixes it, they bias. believe it's... Big bias, I'll try to make it run. They have a bias, <laughs> that's right. They try to make it run. And not only that, they may not fully understand it. Sometimes there's not actually a good communication to the developer for no reason, no fault of their own. They actually missed, um, they may have misunderstood or missed some of the bug report or something like that. And the person who reports it or the tester is generally in a much better position to assess, is, it, is this really closed? Is it really res fully resolved? And at that point, it goes to a closed state, okay? So, so we distinguish uh, between these things. Okay, next time, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be talking about another key QA process besides testing. One that's more, oh man, this is just like, it's an awesome review session. Um, it's just going to be a long review session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, testing finds a larger set of errors than, oh, sorry, Q, uh, peer review finds a larger set of errors than testing, and it finds them more in less time per error than testing, more efficiently. It can be done on things other than executable code. Give me something, once you meet with uh, Dr. Waba again, Give me something that you could do an inspection on, a peer review on. His badge. Do you, oh, you mean like code? E oh, like a, we have a, mm -hmm. like a prototype going right now. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, you could do you could do an inspection with that. You could even include him in the inspection. That would yeah. be a bad bad idea. You could also hopefully work towards something that begins with an R, ends with an S. It has a Q. Mm. As there's a U after the Q. 
request? Requirements? requirements document. You can have a requirements document. You can do a review on a requirements document. You can do a review. What other things besides code? You can do it on code. But what other things besides code could you do? You could do it on a UI design. What else can we do a peer review on? Um, tests. Tests. Test cases, features. Test plans for test cases. Feature plans. Test matrix. A, a test paths through the system that you plan to cover in different tests. There's a, there's a lot of things you can do. And one of the key things, the key points here, if you can just convey this during the final exam, it would be really good, is that you can only really start testing once the what is available. The begins with a C. The code is available. You can start peer review basically immediately. And that helps a lot in terms of quality assurance. Among other things, if you could head off, if you could head off bad implementation decisions, in other words, implementation that's waste by fixing requirements, you've saved quite a lot of work. Suppose I find a requirement only late in the process that's off. What things might I have to throw out? I'll start code. What else? UI, possibly. UI. OK, what's another thing? Test. Test. That test that code, which is now thrown out. Potentially design documents, like the, the technical architecture of the system. So there's a lot of things that have to be thrown away. If you could have found that at the start by checking with the, uh, the, the, um, the stakeholder and by doing a peer review, you're much better off. So peer reviews early, peer reviews often, ladies and gentlemen. Peer reviews are awesome, peer reviews are flexible, peer reviews are scalable. Going from very informal things like pair programming, just passing things to each other to inspect ad hoc review, all the way to inspection. Each of you, mark my words, each of you will, will need to undergo have some artifact you create undergo an inspection at some point during the term. Get going early, get going on, on an often basis because you will find it very likely beneficial. Okay, question. A question for the first uh, submittal. Yes. Milestone, what yes. do we have to have? Okay. Is it like actual code or just documentation of what we are planning to do? 